Hello, everyone. This is James Templeton with the Templeton Wellness Foundation. It's so good to be with you again today. And and uh, we've got a very, very interesting uh, doctor here to talk to today, uh, Dr. Marcia Schaefer. And she is not only a chiropractor, but she has quite a story to share with you about overcoming metastatic thyroid cancer and melanoma which kind of hit her all at the same time. And she's going to tell us everything she did to overcome this and the things that she's doing today to help others. So uh, it's it's going to be quite a interesting interview. I'm very excited. And I want to also tell you uh, to check out our other interviews. We've got a lot of interviews of survivors, people that have survived, most of them late stage cancers, uh, people that have been told to get their fares in order. They've been told all kinds of things. And these people have overcome a near-death sentence. And uh, they share their stories and they tell us everything they did to do this, to overcome. And and they will share with the things you need to know so that when you make the decisions you need to make, a lot of you have cancer, maybe know a friend or loved one with cancer, uh, they've got to make a tough decision here. So we want you to make the best decision that you can, you know, make that's that's going to help you uh, thrive and survive for many years to come. And uh, I also want to tell you about our restaurant guide, Templeton List, templetonlist.com. If you don't know about it, check it out. It's the healthiest restaurants in America, healthiest farm to table, organic restaurants, the the best of the best when it comes to eating healthier. So it's something we put together. We've been working on it for like three years or more. There's over 5,000 restaurants on the list now. It's easy to get to. Uh, just you can do it on your computer or you can go on your phone. It works off Google Maps gives you directions, gives, gives you the information you need. And, uh, you know, always know that if you're going through cancer, it's very important, no matter what diet you're on, is to eat as much as possible at home because we want you to have full control over what you put in your body because I think that's very important. But, hey, if you just want to stay healthier, you want to uh, be on a preventative uh, regimen, you want to... Uh, just get out of the house sometimes or go on a trip or whatever. Uh, this is what this is what Templeton List is all about. So when I travel, I eat almost all the restaurants I go to are, are restaurants that can be found on Templeton List. TempletonList.com. Check that out. Also, check out my book. I used to have cancer. How I found my own way back to health. And uh, if you haven't read this, I think. You will really enjoy it. This is about my story and uh, things I had to go through 37 years ago this year and uh, how I overcame stage four melanoma and just just the things that I went through and and uh, the ways that I made my own decisions. And then I tell you the things I've learned over the years and things I've learned from talking to others for the last 30 plus years and the things that seem to be working for most people. So check out the book, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, it's a great uh, gift for a friend or family member uh, or for yourself, of course. And we want you to educate yourself as much as possible, uh, as quick as possible, so that you will make that good decision. And uh, hopefully it'll give you a lot of hope and know that, hey, if I can overcome cancer and many of these people and all the people I've interviewed have overcome it and many people are you know overcoming cancer and uh, our guest today is going to share how she overcame cancer then why can't you also you just got to do the work and hey it's there uh, don't ever think that that uh, there's not a lot of things you can do so check everything out. We're here to help you as much as we can and help you make that right decision. And uh, but anyway, let's let's uh, go ahead and uh, 
And I want to introduce you to uh, Dr. Marcia Schaefer, and she's a chiropractor. She lives in Wisconsin, and uh, she had to, you know, overcome a diagnosis of uh, metastatic thyroid cancer and melanoma that hit her within two months' time. And she's going to tell us all about all this. And I'm very interesting to hear all of it and excited at the same time. So, uh, Dr. Marsha Schaefer, welcome today. It's so good to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, you have quite a story and, and our listeners are going to really, really be on the edge of their chair, I know, listening to your story. So tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how this all happened and when did this happen to you? You know, when were you diagnosed with this this cancer that you had and, you know, two different types of cancer. So tell us a little bit about how that all just all happened all at once. Yeah. So in 2010, I uh, got married the weekend after I graduated from chiropractic college and um, we were pregnant with our first mm -hmm. and I had him August 25th and um, everything was great postpartum. I, I thought I was just a new mom. I dropped weight really fast and hindsight, of course, I should have been paying attention to what was the signs that were there. Uh, but there was really no, I felt fine for being a new mom. Um, so he was born in August. And by December, I had the first diagnosis, which was papillary thyroid cancer. And um, so when I had gotten all my labs were normal. So this wasn't just a TSH. Mm -hmm. It drives me nuts. That's not a thyroid lab. That's a pituitary lab. So mm -hmm. they would take uh, my full thyroid panel and everything was normal. So I was missing everything with the traditional doctors. And finally it was my dental hygienist because I couldn't extend my head back. And oh. she was like, you know, why don't you, why don't you go to an endocrinologist and actually see some different labs? And they did one lab uh, in December and they said, this is papillary thyroid cancer. We need surgery in January. Wow. So, so January you couldn't lift your, move your neck back. Yeah, I couldn't get my teeth cleaned without swallowing and breathing problems because it was it was the size of my surgeon's fist, and your thyroid's supposed to be about the width of your yeah, thumb. Yeah, yeah. So, so it had, it was really I had a it, huge really, thyroid. Yeah, yeah really inflamed and and yeah. Wow. Yeah. So so did you have any symptoms before that? You know, I know you were pregnant, but did you have? Were you, you know, like your typical thyroid symptoms of being like you know cold hands and feet and, and tired and exhausted. I, I mean, I know you were going through the, the birthing I, process and everything. Well, I was in, I was in grad school, you know, in grad school, you're doing 40 credits a trimester mm -hmm. in chiropractic college. So I was just, I just thought I was a student. <laughs> yeah. I, nothing different that all the symptoms of hypothyroid are also you're a grad student. So yeah, yeah, you're going to be tired. So I didn't know the difference. So, uh, so when you went to the, the dentist, you found this and the doctor says you need to do surgery mm -hmm. and did you do surgery? Yes, I did have a total thyroidectomy. They did that in January mm -hmm. and they also took 30 lymph nodes out of the, the side of my neck. And, um, we found out the 26 came back positive for cancer. And that's when they said, this is, this is metastatic. We have to put you on pause. We can't do any more scans because we don't want false positives. So yeah we're going to wait till March. And because of that wait time, I chose to go into the dermatologist because I'm very fair skinned. And I was just like, I, I don't know, just do a whole check. I might as well make sure everything else is okay. I've got this one diagnosis that I'm dealing with. And she said, you've got two spots on your abdomen, one's on your rib cage, one's on your lower abdomen, which one do you want me to take? And I said, you're the doctor. I, this, oh. this is not my thing. You do it. And she took the one off my rib cage and she said, if you get a note in the mail from us with the, with the biopsy results, that's great. If you get a call from us, that's not good. And I said, well, then, then just don't call me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately I got that phone call and they said it is malignant melanoma. And um, my survival rate went to eight and a half percent chance of five-year survival. 
Um, we did the scans the following month and they said, you've got a mass in your lung and you've got more lymph node involvement on this side. So, um, I, that's kind of where everything started changing for me. Um, Was that from the thyroid that the, you think? Mm -hmm. Well, they don't know. I never let them touch my lung. I stopped at that point. I had already chosen what I wanted to do and I had already been deciding. And so I said, just leave it alone. I know what I'm going to do. And I don't, I don't want to get cut out of me. And was the melanoma, was it like a mole like, or? It was like the tiny, it was like the size of a pen tip. It was tiny. I have no idea how she picked that one. But now that we don't, we, we have no idea if that was in the lung because the melanoma was right above the spot in my, in my lung. So there, it could have been, we just don't know. It's not there anymore. So either yeah. way. Yeah. But you don't, you didn't really, they didn't tell you what stage it was when they removed it. Mm-mm. No, because after they removed it, I, I basically said, I'm done. I, yeah. I don't want to keep going through surgery. And I did, I did end up with one more surgery um, when they took 40 lymph nodes out of this side of my neck. And, um, but nothing happened past that. And there was cancer in those two. Yeah. Wow. Well, so, so you said no more. And, and then you said, well, I got to start. Did you know what to do then? Or did you just start to really dig and start to educate yourself to make, make the decision going forward? Well, my, my mom had been diagnosed and my mom's a clinical chemist. And so when she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2008, she called me and said, Marsha, I'm not doing chemo and radiation. I'm, I'm not doing it. I work in the hospitals. No. And I said, okay. And she said, so what do I do? And I'm like, what? I don't know. And so I chose to get trained in holistic nutrition. And um, so I talked to the the gentleman who was training me and I said, do you think my mom could do some work with you? And he said, absolutely. There's, there's work we can do. So my mom started working with him and we kind of went through his program together and my mom did fantastic. So that was my first experience in 2008. So here it is 2011 and I'm now facing this and Mm -hmm. It was, it was fascinating because when you look at the body and you look at physiology, you can try to stomp out symptoms or you can try to work with the physiology and understand what the body's trying to do. And so my first thought when I got diagnosed was I need to get alkaline. I just, I need to get alkaline. Yeah. And, um, so I would do things to get alkaline and it would get my pH up and then it would come crashing back down. Yeah. And every time it was this roller coaster. And I just said, I, I can't, I can't do this. And yeah. um, one of my friends reached out and said, I have some videos, some DVDs that I would like to send you. Um, would you be interested in watching some of them? And I said, what is it on? And he said, alternative cancer therapy. And I said, okay, send them. And he sent dying to have known and the Gerson miracle. Oh, wow. So, you know, you mentioned something about the being too um, acidic basically. Now, how were you determining that? Was it with uh, pH strips or with? Urine pH testing. Yep. Yeah. So what was it? What was it? Uh, the, the acidity uh, at that time? Uh, I was at 5.5. 5 okay. I I so then you would get, you would try to get alkaline and just go right back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, cancer lives in that, uh, that acidic medium and it just, you know, and then you get more alkaline, it cancer doesn't do well in an alkaline environment. Right. And well, it wasn't until I started juicing carrots that my pH went up and stayed up. And I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) This is, this is weird. Real food is helping. That's strange, (laughs) but it, that's, that's, it's amazing what it can do, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so now you're 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 changing your ways, your diet and everything else and tell us uh what kind of diet did you follow? So I did Gerson therapy. I chose mm-hmm. Gerson. Um so that is a vegan, I mean it's technically vegan um but big juicing juicing diet um and very raw and cooked but minimally cooked. Mhm. So Tell us, like, give us an example of what 
your day would be like as far as your meals? Just real quick. Yeah. So in the morning, it's steel cut oats and um, we could put some prunes in there. You get up and the first thing in the morning that you do is your green juice. And there's only three juices. It's green juice, carrot juice and carrot apple. Lunch is um, a potato, a salad and something called Hippocrates soup. Dinner Mm -hmm. is the same. I really am a creature of habit and I can eat the same food over and over again. That did not bother me. Food psychology goes out the door when you are, you know, saying I can eat these foods. This is what yeah. I'm going to yeah. nourish my body. It's not about, you know, how I feel. Um, and so that's what I did. So I was pretty boring. I ate the same stuff all the time. <laughs> now, you know, that the Gerson diet and, and uh, I guess it was it called the Gerson, what was it? Protocol, right? Is that what it was? I mean, that's been around a long time and there's, it's been very successful. And, uh, you know, you hear, I used to hear a lot about it and not, not as much now because probably because the people that kind of developed it, uh, you know, maybe aren't around now, some of them. And, and that's kind of me, you know, I was on a macrobiotic diet, which was very detoxifying and, you know, was, was a lot of people was like, oh, it's so bland and this and that, but it's like, you don't hear as much about it either, either as much as we used to. But I know when I was following the macrobiotic diet and living in a macrobiotic community and doing all this stuff, I knew that, uh, my, my next choice was going to be the Gerson, you know, if I needed to do something and else. And, uh, because I had talked to a lot of people back then and, they were having really good results with it. I had a good friend that had done very well, you know, on the Gerson diet and protocol and everything. But so one of the things that, you know, the juicing was a big thing. And at one point, I don't think they recommend that now, but it was like eating, wasn't it eating like raw liver? Yes. They used to have you eat raw liver and now it's desiccated. Now it's capsules. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> I never yeah. liked liver. That was the only thing I was kind of worried about because I never liked liver, but the liver pills are fine, you know. So, I mean, that, injections. yeah, injections. so it's interesting. But the other thing, I believe, and you tell me what else you did, but I think I know, but tell me the other things you would do every day. <laughs> Yeah, they, I mean, they had supplementation. Um, we, and a lot of the supplements were digestive enzymes. So it wasn't that it was nutrients. You were getting that from your food. Um, we had clay packs. So we would do clay packs over our liver. Uh, and then of course the coffee enema that Gerson is known for. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. So yep. you were doing like bentonite clay yep. packs to draw out the toxins, to, yes. to start to draw out everything. And then uh, the supplements, you said enzymes, was that between meals? Uh, Some was with meals um, or, I mean, we were juicing. It was the juice every hour. So you never really didn't have something in you. Um, It was, yeah. I mean, the foods, the raw foods that you were juicing are high in enzymes. And then you were taking enzymes too. Right. It was like pancreatin and ox bile and um, pancreatin was a big one. Um, but yeah, it was just supporting, supporting digestion because that's very low in cancer patients. That's right. You know, I, I've interviewed several experts uh, that have talked about enzyme therapy and they've talked about how, uh, you know, some of the research I've done anyway, I'm trying to remember who talked about it, but they talked about how most cancer patients had a very low if you want to call it enzyme bank and that their, their enzymes are deficient and enzymes are one of the body's most uh, effective uh, defenses against cancer. It's amazing. So I just, I love that when you said enzymes, I just perked up, you know, <laughs> inside knowing, cause I take a lot of enzymes myself. I have for years. So, I got pretty fascinated with Dr. William Kelly's work. Um, yeah, yeah. When I was when I was reading because I I didn't feel. I mean, one of my biggest platforms that I speak on now in the cancer communities is if you believe 
what you believe is more powerful than what you actually do. If you don't believe that Gerson is going to help you, it's not going to help you. If you mm-hmm. believe that that chemo is the answer, then chemo is going to be the answer for you. And um, while I feel that people should have choice, they should absolutely know that there are options available to them, which I, I love what you're doing for this. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much that people were coming after me. I feel like it's getting a little more common now that people are accepting that there's alternative options. Yeah, for you're right. Um, but even, I mean, I don't, I can't imagine what you experienced with that, but there was, it was terrible 12 years ago when, when I was going through it. And I said, you know, there's people who do Gerson and there's people who don't do Gerson and they're still living in 20 years. I'm fascinated. And I want to study those people because there's something in their mindset that is different. They have a different perspective in what they want and how they want to live their life. And that changes everything that actually lets the therapy that you choose work for you instead of against you, which is why I just I love it. I love it. I love that idea because I discovered too, you know, I started looking at myself and how did I get well? What did I do? What really worked for me? You know, I'm doing this diet and I and I was doing the diet, you know, like, hey, if it doesn't work for me, it's not gonna work for anybody else. You know, I'm not cutting any corners. I'm chewing my food. 180 times a mouthful, which is crazy. People don't normally do that, but I wanted to, you know, do it the right way. And then I'd go above and beyond if that's what it took to get well. But I was so determined and I started to believe in what I was doing and feeling like I was going to be the hero of my own life kind of feeling. And uh, like, you know, just going to just going to show everybody that it was going to work for me. And I know, I just know, uh, Dr. Marsha, that, you know, 50% or more has got to be up here believing in what you're doing. And I know people that really believe in chemotherapy and they go, well, I really believe in my doctor and and my doctor, is, you know, he's so nice and he's this and that. And we're doing this and chemotherapy and radiation and this and that. And, and I just believe in him, you know, and and I think that's so important to believe in what you're doing. But but as you know, if something's not working, then don't stick around to find out what's going to happen next. That's right. that's some important message to people, I believe. Then you that's why you've got to educate yourself and and continue to understand what's working, why is it working, and and you know this and remember this is king. Right. You know, the brain tells tells you everything that you do in life and everything you need to do next. And and if that brain is full of negativity and fear and anxiety and everything else, it's like a roadblock, you know, that you've got to somehow, you know, get over that or you're going to drown. But right. we can't be in growth and protection at the same time. Yeah, so I agree. The brain is stressed. It's like, nope there's no healing that's going to happen because there's no effort, there's no energy available for it. So what other kind of supplements did you find, take in your, your regimen? Um, I worked with, I worked with glycans um, mainly because when, when I was diagnosed, they said my thyroglobulin was over 600 and it's supposed to be less than one. And so of course my brain said, what is thyroglob? Why have I not heard of this lab before? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I looked it up and it said, it's a glycoprotein. I said, well, what is a glycoprotein? And that's what got me down the rabbit hole of studying glycobiology. And Mm -hmm. now that's a huge component of, of what I do, uh, is work with the glycans and work with the science behind it because, it is fascinating. Uh, it changes everything into your immune system and how your cells can communicate. Um, and that I think is a vital key for anyone that's going through cancer. Interesting. So, um, where's a good place for people to learn more about that? Ooh, um, there's the healing power of eight sugars. It's a book, um, that people can read. Um, there from, from a nutritional glycobiology standpoint, there's, not a ton. Um, I could I could put out some resources on it um, mm-hmm. to just educate on glycobiology. That's something the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has come out with congenital disorders of glycosylation. They talk about the challenges with glycosylation. Um, and you can use Google Scholar also to look at glycans and cancer. And it's just fascinating. Uh, unfortunately, this is a, about a 25-year-old science. 
And so it's just starting to get into the medical schools now. Um, my mom being a clinical chemist was someone that I could go to. And my dad being mm -hmm. a neurochronologist was someone I could go talk to, <laughs> but, but um, still working on, on making sure that we have resources in nutritional glycobiology. Yeah. Well, I'm interested in it because I don't know a lot about it. So I want to learn about it too. So, I mean, I've heard about it over the years, you know, the, the different, uh, uh, beta glucans and things like that, you know, for health. And, yes. but I've not, that's just not something I've known a lot about, but, uh, but interesting. So, yeah. So what else did you take? That was pretty much it. A lot of mine, I dove a lot into the emotional components of mm -hmm. cancer because growing up, I'm, my family's all from Kansas and um, coming up to Wisconsin, I really didn't feel that it was nutritional for me. And, um, when I learned the emotional causes of disease and cancer, especially thyroid, uh, it hit me like a freight train. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's forgiveness that I have got to navigate. And, um, so that's a lot of my journey was, yes, I have the nutrition, but there's this forgiveness component that I must address. And even Louise Hay says, you know, every cancer, there's a forgiveness component. And that doesn't surprise me when most cancer patients, they're, they're getting diagnosed and the hallmark of most cancer, probably 99%, if not a hundred percent of the cancer patients that I have talked to, um, they give so much of themselves and they do not, they do not take the time for themselves. They don't care for themselves because they're always caring for everyone else. Yeah. And, um, so I got True. really fascinated with, with that component of it. And, um, that's, and that, that's where I got into epigenetics and that's where I really got into how your environment influences the expression of genes. Because in reality, if our human genome has a hundred cancer genes, we have a hundred genes that code for cancer, but every single person does not have a hundred forms of cancer. Why do some people express cancer and others do not? That's a huge question that I had to ask of myself and, and just have been fascinating with, with that study. Um, so that's been, that's been something that I've worked on a lot is the emotional components. Well, it's a big one. It's a big issue for people. And, you know, and I've noticed just from my time and for quite a few years there, I was living around a lot of people back in when I was, you know, I don't know, 30 plus years ago, I was living in a facility in a, in a, not facility, but a community. And, uh, you know, a lot of people had cancer that were there. They were trying to heal and, you know, eating organic foods and living a healthy lifestyle and, and all that. But I noticed how the majority of the people that had the cancer were always like really nice people, but more concerned about everybody else you know, wanting everyone to like them, you know, trying to be the, the nicest person, you know, I noticed that so much. And I realized that the, a lot of times the nicest people are the ones that end up with cancer, you know, and, and that's why they're always, they're, you hear this thing, well, how did this happen to me? You know, I've tried to be a good person and blah, 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 but it's true. And then you see these people that aren't very nice a lot of times. And it's, it's like, doesn't seem like anything can get them down, you know, and, and right. maybe they're just not sensitive. I don't know, maybe the sensitivity, but I think a lot of people go through something in life that maybe a bad relationship, maybe a divorce, you know, maybe something like trauma in their life that really kind of triggers a lot of this stuff to happen. You know, Absolutely. a lot of times I see that a lot and, uh, but it's interesting. I, I agree. And I think that's great what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's working now in, in the field of fertility and preconception to try to stop cancer and try to end pediatric cancer. Um, there's so much that's misunderstood about cancer. And, you know, when we can shift it from this is something that happened to me to this is something that happened for me. When people can start to understand why is this happening? Why did this diagnosis let me even look into myself to understand why this is happening? Um, what am I supposed to be learning from this? Mm -hmm. A lot of times we just go straight into the ostrich mode and it's yeah. you know, stick your head in the sand. Don't think about it um, because this is terrifying. And I find that more people are scared. They're not, it's not cancer that we're afraid of. It's cancer treatment. It's chemo. Cancer is not bald. Cancer is not sick. Cancer is not any of those things. 
Mm -hmm. The treatment you choose could potentially make you look and feel that way, but I didn't look any different than I do now (laughs) the entire time I was going through my, my journey. Um, And so I think we need to stop being scared of cancer and see it for what it is and look instead, maybe it's the choice of treatment that is actually making us feel and look the way that we do. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of like most people when they, when they're diagnosed with cancer, uh, they they go to a doctor and it's a shock and and it's and they and they go into kind of the fear mode and you know why me mode and, and all that but you know I think after you get through all this and you start to see good results happening and you see these changes happening you start to overcome and you start to feel like you're you're kind of like uh, as we say in Texas you got the bull by the bar, uh, horns and <laughs> And it's kind of like, you know, I'm doing something. I'm going to get well. I believe this is really working. You know, all that really starts to make a big difference. But uh, I just think it's it's amazing. And the thing that I've always noticed by talking to a lot of the survivors is I don't think it's the worst thing that ever happened to them. A lot of people think, how could this be? This is the worst thing. You know, I'm being punished. I'm this or that. But but I can tell from looking at you and talking to you that this, you don't feel like that at all. You feel like this was your your calling in life and exactly. that this happened for a reason. You know, there's something you're supposed to be doing in your lifetime. And I feel the same way. I feel like it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. And even though at the time, no way. But, you know, but you start to see that and you start to see the bigger picture and, you know, most people kind of wonder and a lot of them go through life and they don't know what they're really here for. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, some people feel like they're supposed to be doing something, you know, on a higher level. And I what I feel, you know, is this the cancer diagnosis was a way to get my attention and a way to turn me in the in a different direction, make me start to, uh, you know, see what's important and what's not important and also uh what could I do to help others? And, you know, myself, I wanted to help others, but I didn't want to do that until I got along to a certain, le- I mean, amount of years, because I felt like people wouldn't believe me at first, you know, they'd say, Oh yeah, well, you know, he's, you know, but after a while, you know, it's like people start to believe and they, 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 they need that. They need people like us to, to get out there and tell our stories and, and give them that, that hope. It's all about hope. Yep. Yep. And understand that there are so many different options and it's, Mm -hmm. it's not about one route. It's about, you need to figure out who you are and what, what you want, because it's, I mean, I chose Gerson because I chose Gerson, but um, it could, I could have said a million different choices. That just was the one that resonated with me. Well, that's, that's the, the right word there resonate or, or, you know, in your, in your, your gut feeling or your heart and soul, or you just, you don't have to be talked into things, right. you know, when it's right for you, you just know, and I'm supposed to do this. And a lot of times people are saying, Oh, I gotta have, he's gotta do this. He's gotta do this. Or she's gotta do it. It usually doesn't work like that. And you're like, well, I tried, but it's all you can do is, is, you know, share and, and, uh, let people know, you know, this is something you might want to look into if they're, if they're real willing and ready, they'll do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had a, a gentleman who came into my clinic and he had been diagnosed with cancer and um, I started working with him and he said, you know, I just don't want to do chemo. And I said, you're, you're a free person. You don't have to mm-hmm. do chemo. Yeah. And uh, I got a call. He'd been working with me for about six months and I went on a trip because I, teach internationally. And I came back and his wife said he went to the doctor and they did some blood test and told him that he was going to die. And within 48 hours, and we needed to go home and we needed to call hospice and we needed to, um, you know, call all the family in and everyone had to say goodbye. He has been in a hospice bed in his, like in our home um, for 24 hours, he has not opened his eyes. Mm. And so she's on the phone telling me this and 
I didn't realize that I was on speaker. I thought I was just talking to her. And um, I said, who do they think they are playing God, telling him how much time he has to live? They have no idea what he has been doing for himself over the last six months. This is insane. I cannot believe yeah. that they just, you know, they can determine that. And uh, she hangs up the phone and her husband opens his eyes, looks at her and goes, you know, she's got a point. And the guy, I kid you not, he lived for another eight months, went out and played golf again, went in and just lived his life. And I was like, stop giving timelines, stop giving, you know, these doom and gloom diagnosis. Yeah. You have yeah. no idea what the capacity of a human being is with that diagnosis and what they're going to turn it into. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's easy to, for, sometimes I think the doctors don't want to tell you, you know, but people want to know a lot of times and they say look you know what are my chances here you know we need to know we need to know what what we're looking at here and a lot of times they kind of act a little strange and don't want to really tell you and i know myself you know almost, i just said you know i want to know you know and and then they tell you but i think they're only telling from their experience a lot of times but but a lot of people they tell you well you got a year to live let's say a lot of them don't make it to seven months because they start to think that and believe that. And right. that shows you how powerful the brain is. And you see that all the time. And you see people that, you know, are told you got, you know, four years to live or whatever, you know, or we think we think it's four years or around that time. And, you know, they they only live two years. But then you see people that are told that they've got a year to live and they're like, fooey on that. I'll show him, <laughs> you know, I'm going to show him and I'm going to do my homework and I'm going to beat this. And I'm not going to sit back and, you know, just get get a chemotherapy and then come back every three months and and not change my diet, not not look at other things, uh, because that's that's what happens to a lot of people. And uh, not saying that the doctors are, they're not doing anything intentional. They're just, that's what they do. And that's what they're trained to do. And, and there's many people out there that will say they had overcame cancer using conventional methods. Usually it's early stage cancer, you know, like a stage one or maybe two, or sometimes not even one. It's like, it's like very early. We caught it in time and they're right, you know, a lot of times, but I'm one of these people that says if someone catches, if 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 someone tells you have stage one cancer, for example, which is an early stage, uh, don't think, well, OK, well, I'll just go live my life and hopefully I won't ever see this again. No, now's the time to roll up your sleeves, look at your life, look at look at your your uh, uh, lifestyle, your diet, your your emotional, you know, health, everything, and start making changes. Start educating yourself. Say, I might have one, but I don't want to have two or three or four, yeah. and I'm going to do something about it now. Or I just had surgery, and they said, oh, uh, you know, we removed this and that. Like, well, you had surgery. I had surgery. Okay, we're going to remove this, and I didn't know what they were going to remove on me because I thought it was just going to be like a, little biopsy type thing when i woke up it was like just, you know but the thing is is now's the time to do something and start looking start thinking about being open to other things because um you don't want to wait around i mean right. some people do and they're fine but i think there's a better chance of something coming back if you if you if you don't take it serious enough to make changes yeah, I often ask people, you know, what if you were diagnosed with cancer tomorrow? What well, would you live your life the same way you're living it? And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, well then, you know, yeah. people are like, I don't know what to change. What would you what would be the first thing that you do in that situation? Yeah. Do it. <laughs> a lot of people just uh, a lot of people just say, well, I'm going out and I'm going to do everything I've I mean, I thought of all that too at the beginning, you know. I'm just going to live my life and I'm a, sort of the bucket list kind of thing, you know. I'm going to do the bucket list. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to party down, you know, and I'm I'm going out, you know, with a bang, I guess, you know. Well, that's that's one way of looking at it, but it's a real dumb way to look at things. It's a real dumb way. And 
I guess if you're 90 years old and you're like, you know, on your last leg and you're kind of like, you know, exhausted and worn out, maybe, maybe that's okay if you still got some energy, but, you know, but when you're 30, 40, 50, 60, you know, or even 70, you know, it's never too late to have, Hey, another 20 years or whatever, you know, something's going to happen to us all, but my God, you know, you know, you want to, live to to uh see your grandkids grow up or whatever is important to you you know and that's important to me and it gives me something to live for and to fight for and and cancer survivors are people that fight and they're the people that they're not you know being too nice all the time like that most of them are is in my view this is my view you got to get down all fours and and knock heads with it and do what it takes to get your body back to balance. It's all about getting things back to balance that, that are out or we wouldn't have had the problem in the first place. But uh, so anyway, you, you did all this, you did the Gerson diet protocol, you did your coffee enemas and how long did you, did you still follow this or? Um, so I did Gerson strict two years. That mm -hmm. was uh, for metastatic cancers. That's it's a two year yeah. Two-year protocol. Uh, six months after I started Gerson, my scans were clear. Wow. So I did maintain the two years um, mm -hmm. and I still do it. I still, I mean, I still do at, like aspects of protocol. I'm still mainly plant-based. Um, so yeah, I still, I still definitely incorporate lots of parts of protocol in my daily life. Yeah. So, so do you, do you exercise? Do you stay active physically? Yeah. <laughs> I have two kids now. Yeah. Um, so I got to Run have another, around everywhere, right? Yep. Yep. I got to have another, another child. And then of course, you know, as a, as a chiropractor, I'm really busy yes. with that. I speak internationally. Um, we're out on our boat. We camp. I'm, you know, I've ridden horses and skied. And so yeah, maintaining activity. I think there's a difference in moving your body to, basically power your brain versus I have to go out and, you know, run five miles today. So it's that I'm a lot yeah, more conscious right. of how I move my body and just like the food, right. That's, it's different when you're like, I have to do this versus no, I, I want to nourish my body through movement, through food, through mindset. Uh, there's just a different, a different approach and how you yeah. you know, how I address those different things. I always like kind of think, I think maybe that's just me, but kind of the battle never ends, you know, because staying healthy, it's all about staying healthy. It's not about, oh, I'm scared of the cancer necessarily, but it's staying healthy, keeping in balance. When something's a little off, you take care of it before it gets out of control. And it just never ends. I mean, do you still do uh, like coffee enemas, you know? Well, I see, I see health as a process, not an event. And yeah. So it's what, something that we're constantly working toward and striving toward. And so if you can ask yourself, how can I be 1% better tomorrow than I was today? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're going to go in the right direction. Definitely. So you just, you keep doing things when you feel like you need to. It's not like I have to. It's like, you know, when you sort of learn, that's how I am. You know, if I feel like I need to do a, a colonic, that's when I'm doing it, you know, and, when I need to do certain things, I do it, you know, and you start, you learn to, to know your body you, and feel, feel things more in a different way and, and try to avoid all that emotional stress and, and forgive, for, learn to forgive. You're right. It's, it's uh, the, a lot of the doctors I've interviewed that are, some of these guys have been, they're all over the world. And a lot of them will say, you got to heal the emotional body. Yeah, I mean, most of them say that something similar to that. So that's a big deal. And believing is probably the king, believing in what you're doing and yeah. believing that, hey, you know, I'm in control. I'm not going to get this again because I, you know, I'm not letting things get out of balance anymore. I'm going to try to my darndest to, to stay in pretty good health. And I mean, nobody's perfect, but it's hard, well, but. The good news is if you do, you know, if you do an, an alternative approach and let's say cancer did, did happen again, mm -hmm. you have the tools and the knowledge of how to come back from it. You, you know, do. it's just, you've, if, if it was to come back, um, you know, then it's going to, yeah. 
can do you, it. You know what you need to do, and maybe you have to make a few adjustments or whatever, but you you know you're not going to go and do the stuff that, 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 you know, most people do because you didn't do it before. Why are you going to do it now? Right. And, uh, or, you know, I did some chemotherapy, but it made me so sick. I thought I was going to die before I got out of there and I just walked out, but it's just, it was just me, you know, I just didn't agree with me, the stuff I was doing. And, and, uh, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a process. It's a journey. And, uh, so, what else, uh, you know, did you do that you think it's important for people to know that we haven't talked about? Um, I mean, I think that I think the biggest the biggest component is just trying to understand why it happened. I don't think there was anything else really that I mm-hmm. that I did other than working on getting my support group around me, making sure that my friends and family um, knew what was the new expected components of my life that it was going to come. And if I was going to come to a cookout, I was going to come with juice and I was going to, I was going to come with the food that I needed and um, just please respect my wishes. And um, I, you know, I, I don't know if this happened to you as well, but for me, uh, people found out that I would do that. I was doing Gerson and they'd be like, Oh, you know, my brother's uncle's third cousin's dog's horse, they did Gerson and they died. And I'm like, are you going to hear that? You're going to hear that. I know you hear that all the time from people. It's like yeah. they can't, like, oh well, yeah, he did okay. He's lucky, but uh, you know, it's maybe I am lucky, but it's not that I haven't done the work. You know, the work. Right. You know, all these years you do the work. It's like a an athlete that does the work, and he's he wins the world championship because he's done the work, and not because he just got lucky. Right. You know, lucky you got to do the work. Do the work. Yeah. <laughs> You got to do the work, roll up your sleeves and do the work. The easy thing is to write everything down. You got to do and say, oh, oh, I can do that. But OK, each day, each day is is, uh, you know, certain things you need to do. And maybe some day some days you do one thing and some days another thing. It's just you, you just got to listen to your body and and uh, avoid the negativity. You know, like these people saying it's very negative. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and that's not good. It's like uh, I hear that all the time, you know, well, so and so. But I've heard of like when I was on the macrobiotic diet and really strict, people go, well, I knew so and so. He didn't make it on that diet. I, I knew some of these people that, you know, and, and they weren't doing everything they should have been doing a lot of times. They're cutting corners. And, yeah. uh, you know, not saying you're I was perfect, but. I tried my darndest to, to, you know, because, you know, when you, when you start to do it and say, well, I was on this diet, but well, I did it. You know, I probably skipped three days. I didn't do it right. And I did this and that, you know, you got to stick with the program. I've interviewed doctors that say that they don't want to accept people to, to, work with these people sometimes because they know they can talk to them. No, they're not going to stick with the program. And if they're not willing to really do what it takes, then they're not going to get the results, Uh, you know, and they don't want to see them fail when there's maybe something out there that might be easier for them to do. And, and, you know, that's just, it's just the way it is. And you got to really, but you know in your heart and soul or your gut or your intuition that this sounds right and I'm and I'm gonna do it and I'm not gonna, you know, look back. I'm going forward with this, you know, and give it a hundred percent. And that's that feeling is is when the healing really starts, I think. Yeah, absolutely. There's a decision. I think there's the decision somebody had said to me, because when I got diagnosed, the, when the melanoma diagnosis came in, um, it was, you know, it's cancer, it's metastasized, it's another form. And that was my breaking point. I, I broke at that point. Cause I said, this is three months in a row that it's mm. two forms of cancer. That's it's awful. all over the place. I've got this three month old baby. What am I supposed to do? Um, they're telling me I won't see him go to kindergarten and, Um, I just, I remember just breaking down crying and I, 
know that that day I made a, a deal with my higher power. And I said, if you let me live, I will spend the rest of my life showing people how miraculously well they're made and how health is something that we all can, it, it's a state of mind. It's a state of, of just being. And um, I think that's a lot that that shift, that decision was when a lot of things changed for me. Um, and I, I, you know, that's when I chose Gerson, I, I went my route and um, but it's really interesting to come face to face with your mortality. And, um, you know, now working with people, I, I just had a woman a couple of days ago who was like, yo, they told me I'm terminal. And I said, you know what, we're, we're all terminal, but the, the beauty of a cancer diagnosis is it's not an immediate termination. And so if, if we get time, we get time to tell people that we love them. We get time to work through our stuff. We get time to close ends and a cancer diagnosis just makes you understand that you are, you're a viable thing that can go away. <laughs> so yeah. make time worth it when you're here and you have the opportunity to do it. And if we can choose to see cancer in that light, we have this massive opportunity mm -hmm. to find our purpose in a much bigger, in a much bigger way for how we can change the rest of the world. I agree 150% on what you said. It's well said. And, uh, how can people get a hold of you, Doctor Doctor Marsha, with uh, you know work with them with epigenetics and and you know some other things that you do with people? Yeah, so on uh, the website would be drmarshashafer.com. Uh, Instagram, I'm Dr. Marsha Schaefer. That would be the other the other approach. And if you are um, more in the fertility epigenetic space, Schaefer Protocol uh, would be another one to follow, um, and the website as well. Can people work with you on like on Zoom or? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I also train and certify doctors all over the country um, sure. that that can also work with people, too. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, it's been a joy talking to you today and uh, and you have such an uplifting message to people. And I agree 150 percent. And and, uh, you know, just keep doing the good work and and uh, you found your calling it was a little tough there at the beginning but you found it and you've got wonderful children and you're doing so so much now for to help people and and uh you know just i you know i just i can't tell you how how much that means to people so and thank you for doing all of this and the work that you're doing too to bring well, to bring the options Thank you. But it's just, you know, it, what you said just really makes a lot of sense. I mean, more than a lot of sense. And, and, uh, but anyway, thanks again for doing this interview and, uh, everybody, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, this was a wonderful time today with Dr. Marcia Schaefer and you know she's inspired me a lot and i feel it you know that makes me want to try even harder just listening to her because you know i think there's no end to what we can all do to make a difference and hey go get well like a lot of these people and do something help others we all need help and people need to to help be be helped with with decisions and you know and and help them to change their lives for the better. And, uh, but anyway, this is James Templeton. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a great, healthy rest of your day.